Hello Booktube! It's Friday and that's time for our comic book addendum, another comic book video, that's what this will be. So uh, those of you who might be new to the channel, it's I'm, I'm, I had some of the channel analytics pointed out to me yesterday and it's kind of alarming that I'm, that I'm still gaining subscribers. I just I just put out the call just the other day, it feels like, for a 7,000 Q&A, a 7,000 subscriber Q&A. And I'm assembling those questions in order to answer them, but we're coming up on 7,100. I'm going to do another Q&A then. You people never seem to run out of questions. But if you're brand new to the channel and maybe you're not interested in comic books, you're going to want to skip this video because I'm just going to talk about comic books in this video. I do it on Wednesday, I do it on Friday, but there are, if you're new to the channel, you may have already noticed, there will be plenty of other videos to watch. <laughs> but one of the things uh, with uh, my Comic Book Friday videos that, I, that a few of you, you comic book fans, have said that you wanted me to resume, I originally thought that on Fridays I would talk about graphic novels, collections, uh, and we would talk about individual issues on Wednesday. Uh, but a lot of you said, uh, then I stopped doing that. I started just talking about the old, my old back issues. And some of you said, no, you can talk about the back issues, but we'd like you to mention a graphic novel now and again, too. And it just so happens that I am reading a graphic novel. I mentioned the other day that I was revisiting a giant omnibus edition of The Avengers, uh, Volume 2, a wonderful era for the book where, that had a great artwork by Don Heck, an artist I don't particularly like, but he did the best work of his career in that run of The Avengers. And... Uh, just a great era for the team, uh, really spanning two eras, the, the, ga the, the gap in between two eras. But that is not always a good time for, for a title. For instance, there's a big hardcover omnibus, Volume 4 of The Avengers, and it also spans a gap between two major eras. But most of the stories in there are terrible. I, 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 had, it, I had my finger poised over the buy button to buy that fourth volume. And then realized, no, <laughs> no, you have these individual issues and you never look at them with the exception of a handful at the very beginning, so don't do it. Uh, imagine a hardcover Avengers Omnibus volume in full color that I'm going to skip. But I was reading that second volume, which I love. I love it dearly. I don't love the size of it. I think I want trade paperbacks. But, uh, but I noticed that there were, there were quite a few things that happen in there uh, that involve time travel and alternate realities and alternate futures and Kang the Conqueror, the Avengers... Uh, great villain. I know those of you who know the Avengers from the Marvel Cinematic Universe are going to think, no, I thought that was uh, Thanos. No. Or you're going to say, I thought that was Ultron. No. No. Oh, well, Ultron is a great Avengers villain. But the greatest Avengers villain of all time is Kang the Conqueror, a, a figure from from millennia in the future who gets bored with his antiseptically perfect world and decides he needs a challenge. And rather than coming back in time and being a good guy, he comes back in time and is a bad guy and is a great villain of the Avengers. Uh, and appears a lot in that second anthology in ways that cause problems. <laughs> now, back in the 60s when those issues were coming out, some readers, including in small town Iowa, noticed some of these problems. These are not just continuity problems. These are what could be called Einsteinian problems. When you muck around with time and with alternate realities and alternate identities of the same character, you are causing problems. And I wasn't the only one who noticed that. Lots of people noticed that. And uh, when I was reading that volume, I was immediately thinking of the greatest possible love letter to Avengers fans conceivable. It was a miniseries. And then it was made into a collected volume, and it is incredible. It is easily the best graphic novel, superhero graphic novel, that exists that I cannot recommend to anyone except people who have been following every single minor detail of the Avengers since the 1960s. Which is very few people. If you are one of those people and you somehow haven't read this book, then, oh my god, are you in for a treat. This is Avengers Forever. Written by Kurt Busiek and drawn by Carlos Pacheco. Just fantastic, elaborately beautiful Carlos Pacheco artwork that just, it's just, just elaborately fantastic. Uh, yeah, and really, it doesn't matter where you go because the, 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 the work is just incredible. Just amazing. I have the same problem with Pacheco uh, that, I, that I've listed with a few other artists, which is that uh, you absolutely cannot tell what's going on from panel to panel. You cannot tell this, understand this story by looking at the artwork alone. And maybe that's a little old fashioned of me to think that maybe you should. You don't have a chance to do it. Not a chance to do it. But it doesn't matter because the story is unbelievable. Music, music decides here to go at all of the Avengers continuity and try to fix it. 
try to smooth it out, try to make one coherent narrative out of it. And that is almost impossible. And I think he almost does it in this book. He almost does it. You have, uh, well, that, this is Kang the Conqueror. Uh, but this is also Kang the Conqueror of, of a different period in his life. He's a time traveler, and he always has been, and I guess always will be. So he not only is different personas in different, t in different periods of his long, long existence, but sometimes the personas don't like each other. <laughs> I know, I know. And uh, in addition to that, Busiek has the great idea of, he wants, since this is an Avengers story, you want an Avengers team. A central Avengers team that goes through this all. Every Avenger who has ever been and every incarnation and every variation shows up in this book at one point or another. They all do at one point or another. Future Avengers, alternate Avengers, everybody shows up in here. At one point or another, they all do. Uh, but there's a core team that Busiek devises, and it's a really good one. It's, it's a really good d decisions on his part. He gives us a couple of traditional Avengers, like, for instance, Captain America, but Captain America from a very specific point in his history where he is, for a minute, for a little while in his, in his continuity, Captain America has super strength, the ability to lift tons and tons of super strength, and is also completely disillusioned with America, a period roughly coinciding with Watergate. Uh, so a great, great to pluck him out of the time stream like that. You also have Yellow Jacket, uh, who is Hank Pym. This is Goliath, that is also Hank Pym. Two different periods of the, of the same person's life. The Wonderful Wasp, you have Hawkeye at a time when he was wearing no shirt. <laughs> but also, in a stroke of genius, uh, Busiek gives us two Avengers who we haven't met yet. One from a, a supervillain team, who we learn in here is going to become an Avenger down the line, and one that is not a character in continuity, the son of a previous Avenger. Uh, and they get caught up in a massively complex storyline involving the, uh, basically a war between the past, the present, and the future. Each one... Uh, manned by a different incarnation of Kang the Conqueror. And, and along the way, uh, Busiek tries to fix uh, Avengers continuity. Not, not really fix it, but make sense of it. He tries to make sense of it. He tries to... Uh, he, he takes you, in off-color panels, he takes you through uh, various highlights of Marvel history and tries to work them into one seamless but extremely complicated timeline. Uh, and it works. <laughs> it works, but I can't recommend it. Unless you are an enormously knowledgeable fan of the Avengers and Marvel continuity just in general. I can't recommend this, even though it's fantastic. Every bit of it is fantastic. And the issue, in this case, would be the chapter. Later on in the series, I think it's ch uh, chapter 7 or 8, there's an issue that concentrates on Kang the Conqueror himself as a character. And there ought not to be a way to go back. There ought not to be a way to go back from that chapter. It is so good. Kang forever afterwards from that chapter ought to be a far more complex character than someone who shows up in issue number 119 of West Coast Avengers for one issue with a fiendish plan and gets thwarted. The, the, that chapter was a, just a brilliant excavation of an old and fairly one-dimensional character. I just loved it. But I loved a lot of here. There are a lot of great moments all throughout here. And naturally, I was driven to it by reading that Avengers anthology. So that's your, that's your graphic novel uh, for today. And then we'll do some back issues. I will keep an eye on the time. Uh, so what have we got next here? Uh, okay, all right. We have more issues of The Watchmen. This also is a great collection, only this one doesn't need you to be an expert. Alan Moore... The writer Alan Moore, uh, who is, uh, uh, not all of his dogs are leashed. <laughs> he has no blue M&Ms in his bag, if you know what I mean. Uh, he's nuts. Uh, but in this ish in this miniseries, DC let him just do a great take on superheroes. And he the artwork is by Dave Gibbons, and it's fantastic. And I bought all 12 issues. I By issue number three, I was hooked and wanted, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. And then it became a collection, and the collection has been reprinted ever since. Not only because it's beloved, but also because if Marvel doesn't reprint Watchmen in some form or other every year, the rights to it revert back to Alan Moore. And he goes from being a millionaire to being a trillionaire. <laughs> and they don't want that to happen, so they will reprint, there will be reprints of Watchmen forever. Uh, but this is issue number 3, number 11, and number 12. The final, number 12. I mentioned how in the back of these things, blood is dripping down onto a doomsday clock that is slowly approaching midnight. 
and uh, in, in issue number 12, it gets to midnight, <laughs> and there's a great, great conclusion, a, a fantastic conclusion to the whole storyline. The, the plan of one of the characters, not for evil, but for good, but through evil means, is it all takes place in an Arctic fortress, and those of you who haven't seen the Zack Snyder movie is actually very good in its adaptation of that moment. Uh, but it is incredible. Oh, it's just incredible. The conclusion of it is incredible. I've been following it all along and uh, disliking some of its creative choices, liking some of its other creative choices. Of course, if you know, if you've watched my comic book videos, I am an unironic fan of unironic heroes. And it's a little sad to me that they are disappearing from comic books and maybe gone forever. Moore is no fan of such a thing. He hates that kind of idea as inherently fascistic. So idealistic heroes get served on brochette in The Watchmen, all, mostly throughout the book. Uh, but there's one particular plot line that, that comes to culmination at, in the, at the end of issue number 12. And I swear, when I got that issue, I was literally, I know it's a cliche, but I was literally holding my breath, just turning the pages as fast as I could read them to find out how this story ended. That is something. And it still works on me, even when I, I periodically reread The Watchmen. Uh, oh, okay. All right, here we have Salvador La Roca. This is, uh, this is artwork by Salvador La Roca. That must be why I want this. Yeah, look at that. Oh, how gorgeous. Oh, my. This is a, a, a short-run series called Namor that had the very interesting idea of giving us the adventures of Prince Namor the Submariner when he was a teenager, when he was, uh, when he was a little boy. As opposed to the the slightly older Prince Namor who encounters the Nazis and the Human Torch and Captain America and starts to join the the surface world, which is part of his heritage. This is this is uh, something else. This is this is just uh, his Atlantean adventures. Uh, don't I didn't I mean I got it. This was back in the nineties, I think. Uh, when was this? Two thousand three. Uh, I got it. Uh, back then because as as i've probably made clear i'm a big fan of this character he doesn't have gill slits but leave, let's leave that out artistic license but uh, i'm a big fan of this character and even at the time when i was getting this i was thinking okay well this isn't this isn't canon <laughs> it can't be we know when prince namor meets humans on the surface and he doesn't meet them as as a child <laughs> that would change everything about him if, if it did it's not it's not a trivial thing it would change everything about the character so this can't be canon. I don't know what, I don't know how long this went on. Don't know how long Salvador La Roca stayed with it. I only got it for the artwork uh, and my, my interest in the character and seeing Salvador La Roca's interpretation of the character. But I don't know if it's ever been collected. I don't know if, if it went on for any length of time. This is issue number one, and I don't, I don't think I have any others. Um, okay. All right, this is uh, fantastic stuff. This is from the 90s. I have to believe this is from the 90s. Just judging by the height of the hair, 1992. This is Quasar, uh, which is written by, I never really cared who wrote it, Mark Grunewald. The important thing is that it's drawn by Greg Capullo. And Greg Capullo is a fantastic artist, absolutely incredible comic book artist. And he's one of those artists where when he jumps from one title to another, he ups his game. This is an artist who has constantly been improving. A lot of you might know him as an artist on Spawn. But he has constantly been experimenting and getting better, trying new things. And this represented an enormous quantum leap in his artistic ability from the previous thing that he was doing. I'm, even, I'm having trouble even remembering what it was. And his Quasar run is great. Just fantastic. Uh, I don't know if I can get you... Oh, his, his paneling is just great. Just, it just fantastic. Uh, Quasar is a very bland character. A very, very... Uh, bland, boring character. I, I would never have bought a, something about a, a vaguely cosmic-powered hero if it hadn't been drawn by Greg Capullo. But one of the interesting things about the Quasar books, I don't think you'll see it quite so much uh, in this book, in this issue, but we'll encounter other issues and maybe we'll see it then. One of the interesting things uh, is that in these issues, I don't think this ever came out in any kind of interview. I'm not, this is totally ex cathedra. I don't know if, if Greg Capullo has ever admitted this. I don't think he could and stay on the payroll at Marvel or DC or anywhere. But there's a very strong gay subtext in his issues of Quasar. It's not just that Quasar is drawn absolutely lovely. <laughs> He's not drawn as a superhero. I mean, he is. He is drawn vaguely, heroically as a superhero, but he's also drawn as what scientists refer to as a kumquat. <laughs> and it's not just that. It's that uh, his 
panels shared with other male heroes tend to be a very tender nature. Very there's there's a subtext going on in these issues. I love them. I love them for a lot more than that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Except for those of you who are professionally engaged in getting me wrong. But don't get me wrong. I love them for a lot more than that. Grunewald does a fairly good job. But there's something going on in the artwork that I've always found interesting. Uh, oh, okay. This is a, a Thor annual uh, that I got, obviously, for the feast of the artwork. I love the character of Thor in Marvel Comics. This is Thor annual, double-sized annual number 13. As those of you who are comic book or Thor aficionados will know right away, that's a Walt Simonson cover. And this, this annual took place in the middle of Walt Simonson's great run on the character. Uh, so that would have been a reason to get this anyway, is because it has a Walt Simonson cover. But it has John Buscema in side artwork. That, and that is, uh, this may be one of the last times that Buscema ever drew this character. I don't, I don't think it's, I mean, maybe one or two times that I can think of after this. Uh, but then that was it. And it's gorgeous. It's not, uh, this, this artist did a lot of very phoned in work for Conan very late in his career around the time that he was doing this, but this is not phoned in. This is absolutely lovely. So I, uh, yeah, this wasn't, this wasn't even written by Walt Simonson. He had nothing to do with it except the cover, but I grabbed it anyway. And one of the reasons I grabbed it is the same reason that I've mentioned, which is where would it be collected? I don't have any idea. Down the line, way down the line, it'll be part of a Thor epic volume or a, a hardcover Marvel Masterworks volume, but who knows if I'll want the rest of what's in that volume. So I grabbed it and I held on to it. Uh, uh, okay, here's Dark Horse. This is uh, Grendel Tales, uh, one through four. And believe it or not, it's Devil's Choice, and I have all four. <laughs> Ordinarily, when I see a one through four miniseries on this, these throwback channels, I, I, I don't have all of them in one place. But here I do. This is uh, written and drawn by, uh, I believe, uh, two, a Bosnian writer and a Bosnian artist who were writing and drawing this within a hearing distance of shelling. And it's all about, uh, vaguely about, uh, the character of Grendel, which I... I uh, I'm not interested in it at all. I don't have any other Grendel books at all. These, this is not that character. This is a sort of a takeoff of that character. And it's one story, and it's contained in these four issues, and the artwork is really, really good, and that's why I got these. And that's why I've kept them, uh, even though it's, it's very military sci-fi that's all throughout here. And the Grendel, the main character, Grendel, is not typically that. Uh, and I kept these things. I, I've, I've held on to them, even though they were collected in a graphic novel, and I do have that graphic novel. So I don't know why I have the original issues. Where would I get rid of them? I guess is the issue. Where I've just recently learned the the byways and some of the byways of eBay. But what about selling on eBay? I have no idea. More headache than it's worth, even once the post offices are open again. Uh, okay, then we have uh, the Legion of Superheroes. So maybe we'll be able to get through a few of these. No, I'm afraid it's only three. Oh no, <laughs> no. All right, this is the Legion number one. Uh, Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning, a great creative team for the Legion. Uh, this is. Legion number one, a very unusual cover design that's meant to be horizontal, uh, and fantastic uh, artwork on the inside. Just, just amazing, amazingly detailed, beautiful artwork on the inside. Uh, and I, I think I have, this is number one, two, and three. Yeah, this is number one, two, and three. Uh, Dan Abnett has the great idea to make one of the, the Legion has a regular roster of supervillains. And uh, Dan Abnett had the great idea for this, the first run of this particular run of one of their many, many, many relaunches to make the villain of the piece Ra's al Ghul, the immortal, uh, the immortal swordsman enemy of Batman in the 20th century. I didn't think it would work at all, and it does. It really, really does. So, and it has all of the Koypal artwork, and that is just fantastic, just incredible all throughout. I have all of this run, and I don't know where the rest of them are, and I don't think they've ever been collected. I have all of this run somewhere. No idea where. Uh, oh, okay. Here's number one of uh, the Topps comics, Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, which is adapted from the screenplay of the the uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie by Roy Thomas and drawn by the great Mike Mignola right before he became the great, the great Mike Mignola. He drew this before he created Hellboy. And now, you know, Hellboy is world known. Uh, the dead travel fast. There's... Gary Oldman as Dracula in his weird lobster armor. <laughs> and as silly as this stuff looks uh, on the screen, it looks just fantastic on the page. Just incredible. There's John Harker being sucked into the bedclothes. 
incredible. Oh, and I have this even though I have the collection. I, this, these were collected and I got it. So uh, I, I kept these issues. Again, where would I get rid of them? So I don't, I don't know why. Uh, oh my, look at that. Okay, we have Wonder Woman Annual number one uh, from the 1990s when George Perez relaunched Wonder Woman for DC Comics. Batman was getting a relaunch, Superman was, the Justice League was, and he decided to give Wonder Woman a proper relaunch. His Wonder Woman issues are wonderful. The reason I got this, I don't have many of those issues, even though I love George Perez's artwork, because I don't particularly like his take on the character. And it's for the same reason, because in order to make her palatable to a mostly male buyership, Perez had to downgrade her superpowers. And that drives me crazy. <laughs> that drives me absolutely crazy. There's an issue, I think it's issue number two, of the Perez run on Wonder Woman, where we see her give a demonstration of her various powers. The bullets being deflected off her bracelets, her ability to fly. And at one point, we see her holding on to a fighter jet on the, on the tarmac and holding it back from launching, with this, with just with the physical strength of her body. And Perez cuts to a panel showing that she's, it's almost more than she can do. She's at the very limits of her endurance. When Wonder Woman should be able to do that, bored forever with one pinky. She, this is a character who is easily as strong as Superman. And if you have to downplay that in order to make her interesting, then you're not the right writer for her. Uh, but nevertheless, most writers have done that, so I guess she hasn't had all that many right writers. But the reason I kept this annual is because it's not just George Perez. He does one issue, the artwork of one issue in here, but uh, there are lots of others. There are lots of other... Jose Luis Garcia Lopez has a great stint in here. Kurt Swan has a great stint in here. There's all sorts of... Who else do we have here? Uh, Ross Andrew, Brian Boland. Uh, just just great. Art Adams, who's not really great for Wonder Woman, but still. Uh, it's an annual that I revisit just for the artwork because it, you get many different artistic interpretations of the character, which is great. Uh, okay, then we have two, two copies of... This is Larry Hama's run on Batman. Uh, and I don't, I don't particularly care about that, but this, these are drawn by Scott McDaniel, who is, as I've said many times when these comic book videos come up, he is a great Batman artist. In a perfect world, Ed McGuinness would draw Superman, would have drawn Superman for 100 issues, and Scott McDaniel would have drawn Batman for 100 issues. They would have had, and, and we would be talking about an epic run on both of them. Ed McGuinness is a perfect Superman artist, and Scott McDaniel is a perfect Batman artist, and yet I, I don't think he did any more than maybe... I don't know, at most 20 of these issues? Scott McDaniels, one of his signatures with Batman and with Nightwing is to have bats flying around whenever the character appears. There are always bats in the, in the background. I always think that's neat. I wonder if he does that in the internals as well uh, when Batman is facing, in this case, a, uh, a marine biologist who transforms herself into an orca. <laughs> Singularly... Uh, a singularly r regretful <laughs> supervillain choice. No, he doesn't. But either way, uh, these are awesome. The artwork in here is just in infinitely revisitable. And these will be reprinted. Somehow, they will be reprinted. I don't know how. I will keep track and see if maybe there's an all Scott McDaniel volume of Batman that's reprinted. I would love that. Uh, okay, then we have uh, an Elseworlds volume. This is uh, Superman the Man of Steel. It's written by Priest. And uh, it's drawn by M. D. Bright. Uh, the Elseworlds books were sort of what if storylines, and this is one uh, where uh, Superman has largely turned against the superhero world, if I remember correctly. And we have a very old and battered Batman who is fighting the lone fight of resistance against the fascistic Kryptonian. Uh, these Elseworld uh, things have been collected into volumes over time, but I only have this one. Uh, oh wow. Oh my. Okay, this is uh, Thor. This is again Thor, and this is uh, Thor number 300. The 300th anniversary. This is 382. This is the 300th anniversary of Thor, because Thor didn't start off with the first issue at Marvel Comics. He started off in Journey into Mystery. And this is Walt Simonson. This is right in the middle of his... Or no, this is towards the end of his run. You have a Walt Simonson cover. You have a Walt Simonson uh, up in the logo box there. The artwork is by Sal Buscema. Uh, and uh, has a great... A great fight between Thor and Loki, and the Destroyer's armor, of course, shows up here. And then there's a confrontation at the end where Loki is just complacently telling Thor that he's, you know, you're an imbecile to be good, you're an imbecile to be pure-hearted, why, why, why do you even bother? And Thor gives him a little reminder of his place in the order of things by breaking his arm. <laughs> That's 
<laughs> Much appreciated. <laughs> uh, then what have we got? Oh my. Oh goodness gracious. Oh goodness gracious. Oh my. Okay. Believe it or not, we're going to end this. We're going to end it early. Uh, because the, the next like 30, 20 issues are all the same thing. It's all the X-Men. Good Lord. My back issues never have things collected like this. Why is that, I wonder? Okay, this is... We saw the first issue of this run, and it's, it is tragically detached from the other issues. This is the, the Jim Lee run on the X-Men. Just issue after issue after issue. There you go. This is uh, issue number two. There's Magneto. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, no, this is... <laughs> okay, this is... Uh... This is not the Jim Lee. This is a, another random issue drawn by John Romita Jr. I, I have as many of those as I can get because I love his artwork. Uh, then we have issue number seven of the Jim Lee X-Men introducing Omega Red. Issue number five of the Jim Lee X-Men. Issue number four. It's a long rambling story introducing the same character. Issue number three. Uh, then we have X-Men Unlimited number one. Who drew this? Chris Patalo and Scott Lobdell wrote it. This is uh, X-Men Unlimited number one. And the, the uh, story that, that, it, that introduces this thing, I think this came out four times a year, but the story that introduces this is terrific. Just terrific. And all for the writing, I must say. I love Chris Piccolo's outlook, but it's all for the writing. Oh no, all right, here's another. I, had, I showed you a first issue of the Jim Lee X-Men. Here's another one with a, with a variant cover. That, that first issue had a number of variant covers that you could assemble into one big panorama. I guess I must have got two covers. Uh... Here's an, a random issue of X-Men, uh, the, the Wedding of uh, Scott Summers and Jean Grey. Uh, here is a, just a random chance, a double of number two <laughs> of the Jim Lee run. Uh, here's another relaunch of X-Men, number one. Is this the Jim Lee again? Oh my god, it is. How many covers do I have for this thing? Good lord. There's another variant cover for number one. Uh, and then three more issues of the Jim Lee run, eight, ten, and eleven that I just, I just happen to have these. I, I go back to them sometimes, but I think I'd much prefer them in a book than these issues. Uh, and there you go. Look at that. We finished before 35 minutes because we hit a block of the same title. Shows you what, how expeditious organizing these things would be if I ever thought to do that. Uh, but I'm, I don't think I'm going to be organizing my long boxes anytime soon. <laughs> so you're just going to have to deal with the disorder. Wow. Okay. So this ends with a big, big batch of X-Men. I'll have to make sure to try and keep those together. Alrighty, so there you go. There are your comic books and an uh, unrecommendable graphic novel. Avengers Forever is unbelievably good. And the people who know that already know that. And no one who doesn't know that will ever know that because they'd have to read comics for 30 years to find out. <sighs> it's, it's a weird world. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.